going on in her own life, you're welcome to come forward for individual prayer following worship today. Um, and then also today is the start of our focus on stewardship for the month of October. So we'll begin to hear temple talks during worship today. We'll get to hear from Linda Jackson as she shares a bit about her faith and how music intertwines um, with her faith as well. Um, and then you'll also see in your bulletin the little, um, oh my goodness, insert is the word that I'm looking for. Um, there's an insert in there that you can take home and read. Um, also be emailing it out on Wednesday to um, anybody who has been joining us online or um, has been in worship with us today. Um, yeah. And then also you'll notice that in at the offertory, we have a song called, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. So I'm guessing as I see some people nodding, like the choir has been singing it. Um, some of you may have heard it. I don't know if you, have you seen a lot of not? So a lot of you know it. But I will say for those of you who don't, it's pretty easy to pick up. It's, I am not a music person, but I, so I think if I sing a CC, it actually means it's fairly easy to pick up. It's pretty repetitive. Um, and it goes along with our theme of abundance and that we always make decisions as a community based out of the love that has first been given for us. So we're going to sing that throughout the whole month of October. So if you don't know it, you get to know it really well by the end of October. Um, so those are all the announcements that I have on the panel to make sure to keep a peek in your bulletin. There's other things in there as well. So let's take a moment to take a deep breath and center ourselves for worship this morning by this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives 
here. I usually stand over there. And that's a much more comfortable spot for me, okay? But I do stand there on Sunday mornings, and do you know why? I love making music, especially when I make music with a group of friends who like making the same kind of music that I like making. And, it's, and I especially like making music in church because that's my favorite way to pray. Okay, so it all started because I loved singing. And since I didn't know anyone who could play guitar or piano for me back then, I decided I had to learn to play guitar. Of course, I was only 14 back then. And I begged my mom for my first guitar. It was a Sears Silvertone. I mean, it's not exactly the Stradivarius of guitars, but it was worth every penny of the $20 that my mom spent paying for it. And between that guitar and the five o'clock mass that I like to go to on Sundays, I thought I found my calling. I, uh, St. Mary's had always had this little booklet of the songs that the folk mass was going to have. And in that booklet, they had the chords to the songs. So I borrowed the little booklet and brought it home with me and started working on my songs. I, granted, they were all very easy songs to sing, just like, uh, and they'll know we're Christians by our love was one of them. And I would uh, practice those songs. And when I got to high school, I attended Mary Immaculate Academy. Okay? That was a girls' school, a Catholic girls' school. And there were about 140 girls attending. But one of the things they did is, on every first Friday of the month, we would have a mass. And it would be in the gym at 1 o'clock. Okay, and after that, we all got dismissed early. Well, at first, the school would sing the songs a cappella. No, you know, there's no background music, just... I think the music teacher was able to stay at that time. And then eventually, he just couldn't come and stay any longer. So the principal had heard that I liked to play guitar. So she came up to me one day and she said, uh, Linda, do you think you can play some hymns for us on First Fridays? And of course, you know, I go, yeah. <laughs> I would love to play hymns for you. I said, can Janice do it with me? She was my good friend and I, between the two of us, we were quite the singers. And so uh, at that point, um, I was so excited, I told her yes, and Janice could help me. But you have to remember, we would do this mass in a gym, and there'd be like about 150 girls there. They were all singing, there were no more mics. So we learned to sing loud and to play loud, and we were joyful, <laughs> and we had a great time. The best part of uh, First Fridays, though, that, you know, I didn't have to go to any classes. I would just go around to all of the classes and I would say, okay, let's all practice this song. And the nuns would just sit down and we would all practice the song and we'd move on to another class and we'd do the same. Never went to class on First Fridays. And the other fun thing was that in typing, Sister Cyril, I loved her. She was very determined to help me pick out songs. So I would go to typing, never learn to type because I was sitting next to Sister Cyril's uh, re uh, record player and she would play songs for me, you know, such as um, the Prayer of St. Francis. I would sit there, everybody else is typing along and I'd be trying to figure out how to play these songs, but then she'd make sure I got the music so I knew what the chords were. So. Okay, so we're moving along here, and I, I married David, we had kids, and it was kind of hard when the kids were little to play guitar, because, you know, you got three little kids under the age of two. You don't have much time at that point. I was a little sad about not having time to play. Then one day I turned on the TV, and there's this priest gave, who was giving a sermon, and he was talking about using your talents. So I I listened for a little bit to see what he had to say. And he said, if you play guitar, that's who you are. I thought, oh my God, God talked to me. <laughs> I felt blessed at that point. 
So then uh, it was a couple weeks later when Pastor Joe Han Hansen came up to me and goes, you know, do you know anybody who plays guitar? We need someone to play music with the junior high kids. I, I play guitar. I could do it. I'd be happy to do it. So that's how I got started playing music here. So one day, um, Pastor Johansson came up and he said, uh, I'd like to invite the, the Emmanuel kids to go sing at that early morning sunrise, Easter sunrise service out by the library. Do you guys think you could do it? And of course, you know, you know me, I don't say no. I said, yeah, we could do that. So me and one other kid <laughs> showed up over there. But first, Pastor Johansson said, uh, says, you need a name. What's the name of this group? We had five minutes to come up with the name, and the name was the New Day Singers. Why? Because when Christ came, he brought a new day, a new beginning for all of us. It was as if the sun re-rose, and we had a new day. That's where that name comes from. And of course, it stuck around for a long time. Um, in those early days, I've been involved in music uh, for a long time now. We started uh, with three services where you had the 8.30 service and they had their singers. And then we had the 9.15 contemporary service, which the New Day singers played at. And then we also had the 11 o'clock traditional service. At, by the time these three, the 9.15 service came about, the New Day singers had evolved into a lot of, you know, adults also with a couple of the kids and it just moved on to the group that you see today. Um, you know, the music service times have changed. We've incorporated many different hymnals. Uh, music styles have changed. Um, you know, even I changed. I still play with the New Day singers. And, but now I also sing with the anthem choir, which has brought me a lot of fun, joy. Uh, you know, I never thought I would be in the anthem choir. You know, it's just not the guitar-led music. But you know what? I've gotten to know everyone, and I've found that the music that we play here at Emmanuel reflects the diversity of the congregants of our church. We have many heart, diverse hearts reflecting many diverse styles of music. And I think that we've eventually kind of um, evolved into a church where we have so many different types of music being played on a Sunday. And I find that we're extremely fortunate to have that. One important part about being involved with the music at Emmanuel has been, learn, you know, choir is not an elite thing. We have people from many musical backgrounds who sing with us. You know, I, you know, I'm not a trained musician. I never really had a music lesson. I learned to play guitar with little music books, learning how to play the chords, and so I'm not as good a, a reader as other people around me. But you know what? Working with other people, you start to develop and uh, build on your skills. We're extremely fortunate to have Jeff Sorois as our, our, our director. His musical leadership skills, kindness, and sense of humor have made our rehearsals a great experience. Choir, regardless of the choir that you're in, it's a fun place to be. And I wanna brag a little bit too. We have a great choirs with great people, and we are so fortunate. And the door is always open to anyone who would like to also participate in the choirs. So let's say you want to you want to participate in one or both of our choirs, but you can't make a full commitment. Talk to Jeff. He would be an excellent person to talk to. Maybe you want to just sing for the Christmas uh, services, or maybe you want to sing for Easter, or you want to be part of the um, summer pickup choir. Those. Those opportunities are there for your taking. You don't have to feel like you have to be a trained musician. You just come and sing along with everyone. And, then, and there's also the Worship and Arts Committee. 
If you're interested in exploring how we make our services a more mean meaningful and vibrant place for our congregation, you're welcome to attend and to provide us with your thoughts and anything else that you want to contribute. Talk to me, I'll let you know when the next meeting will be, or you can speak to anyone on the committee. There's always room for new folks and new ideas. So, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, so that takes us right back to creation. In the second chapter, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, it was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. The word of the Lord. The second reading is a letter of Paul to the Hebrews, the first chapter. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned with glory and honor, subject all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, 
We do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the sufferings of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel.
And if the man dismisses his wife, she gets and she gets remarried again, and that husband dies or divorces her, the first man can't go back and say, I'd like to marry you again. I don't find you objectionable anymore. Because that would just be silly, right? And so in this, is divorce allowable? Sure sounds like it. In what circumstances is divorce allowed? It says a man may dismiss his wife if she displeases him. Please. <laughs> Hard time saying this out loud. And it seems that that interpretation of displeases is up to the man. What we're just going to do. And so then, what happens to that woman and to her children if they have children together? They are sent out of the house. The woman is vulnerable and desperate, and the children are orphaned without a support system. It's also important to note that marriage is different than what I would say our understanding, at least in the United States, is, right? Our understanding is like what we see on romantic comedies, that you fall in love, you date, there's this great love story, you decide to commit your lives together, and you have this beautiful way to celebrate that love. But really, during this time, marriage was just an economic transaction. There were reasons that the parents would arrange a marriage between two people based on bringing families together, often creating power relationships. And all of those reasons don't really have a whole lot to do with our understanding of marriage today. Now, it probably won't surprise you that there was some debate over how to understand that reading from Deuteronomy that I read during the time of Jesus. There were some people who thought that that passage from Deuteronomy is, if I find my wife objectionable, she's not the best cook in the world, or she's grumpy in the morning, whatever it is, I, as a man, would have the authority to, by God to write a bill of divorce. But then there was another understanding that said, no, you're forgetting other pieces of scripture. You're forgetting other parts of the law. It says over here in this other part of the Torah that divorce is only permissible only if a woman is unfaithful. So there is this deep raging battle going on. Why and in what circumstances can someone get divorced? Is it for any reason that is displeasing to the husband? Or is it just that the woman is unfaithful? And as usual, as Jesus is heading towards the cross and towards Jerusalem, the Pharisees are trying to trip Jesus up. The Pharisees are most likely not really that interested in an actual conversation about marriage and divorce. The Pharisees probably just want to create some conflict and discord between the followers of of Jesus and are trying to set him up at this point. So we see Jesus reference our first reading from Genesis 2, in which God in the beginning of creation creates everything that we are surrounded by. And everything is good, except for one thing, but there is only one human and that human is alone. And so God creates a second from the first person. In this creation story, yes, there are two in Genesis. The woman is created from the man's rib, and hence you see this basis for marriage. Now, almost all of us, or all of us, I think I can probably be bold to say all of us, have been touched by divorce in one way or another. One time, a woman who was divorced described that this text to me as having smelly trash from all over her that everyone can smell. If you've ever talked to someone who is divorced or has been remarried, perhaps in the Catholic Church, and they have been turned away from receiving communion at the holy table, they will say that it feels like being turned away from Christ himself. And it's painful. And if you ask any 
founding member of the LGBTQ community, what the Genesis 2 text means to them. I bet they'll tell you too. I bet they'll tell you that they haven't memorized that marriage is only between a man and a woman because it has been ground into them and hammered over their head from the time they've been coming to church and has been used to tell them that their marriage and partnership is not legitimate. Now let me tell you, everyone is welcome regardless of sexual orientation. They are welcome regardless of marital status. They are welcome regardless of their history or any other barriers that tend to keep us from being part of a community at church. At the end of this conversation about divorce, Jesus takes a child and he puts that child on his lap. Again, remembering a couple weeks back, that child who has no value in society, a child who has no importance, who could be orphaned at the simple signing of a divorce decree, who is considered castaways and expendables, nobodies. And right after Jesus references this creation story, Jesus takes that child and lifts the child up and blesses it. If you still think this text is about moral law, then we are like the Pharisees. And all I can say is if you have ever felt like an orphan, or how that divorced woman felt in first century Palestine, or that woman that felt when she heard this gospel text, that she was unworthy of a seat at the table, then let me tell you, you've come to the right church. You've come to the right faith. Because this faith points to Jesus. The one who has the power to heal the broken and the brokenhearted alike, and the one who claims us as his own. This is a faith that points to community, which strips us of all of our titles and histories and pride and our scars and our wounds and welcomes each of us equally. This is a faith that points us to the cross each and every time. And as we point to that cross, we remember those words from the Gospel of John that says, God so loved the world, the whole world, not just some, not just a few, not those who seem to have it all together or are perfect or get it all right, the whole world, that he gave his only son to die for them and us, and whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I say to you again, if you ever felt low or forgotten or like a nobody, let me remind you, you are the children. You are loved, you are blessed, and you belong.
challenged by God's word in Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and the whole creation. God of our ancestors, we give thanks for the church in all times. May we listen for the prophets of this age who bear messages that stir the church toward renewal and justice. God of grace, hear our prayer. Creator of every creature on earth, direct our lives toward the renewal and sustaining of cattle, birds of the air, animals of the field, and those who share our homes. Reveal the ways we can work alongside creation for the health and well-being of all. God of grace, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, we give thanks that you are mindful and benevolent, even us, more, mere mortals. Accompany us when the hardness of heart gets in the way of justice between people and nations. Endow leaders with minds for justice and hearts for compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. Restoring God, grant healing and wholeness to those who are sick and suffering. Especially, we ask that you be with Dan and Julie, Joe, Mary, Ken, Virginia, Deborah, Jeffrey, Elaine, and Tom, Mike, George, Georgia, Debbie, Marcia, Michelle, Betsy, Art, June, Ray, Nancy, Peter, Lori, Judy, and Linda, Giovanni, Laura Beth, Andy, Bert, Jean, Brittany, Chris, and Blake Lynn, Ed, Mark, David, Garrett and Kayla, Dave, George, Diane, Amelia, Marion, Cheryl, Rosemary, Karen, Ron H., Norm and Brenda, Marianne, Ernest, Herb, Joe, all members and friends of Emmanuel, our homebound members and their caregivers, friends and members of Emmanuel who are currently serving in the military, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, our companion synod, young adults in global mission, and our partner in MAP, Bolton Congregational Church, UCC. God of grace, hear our prayer. You are the great physician, healer, comforter, and friend. Send your Holy Spirit to bless these prayer shawls, those who created them and those who will receive them. May the prayers woven into them with love be as comforting as the warmth they offer the shoulders and laps they cover. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray unto Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we are stopped.
Spirit. Holy God, you have welcomed us to this meal and fed us with dignity at your table. Send us now to welcome others and to be at peace with one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus. Thanks be to God.